Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Manos, for his, your kind invitation. I'm very happy to come here, as always. And good morning, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> My talk is uh, about engaging the SACS and uh, on track, off track uh, concept. Uh, this is my disclosure of conflict of interest. So let's start again from the bond glenoid defect because uh, this is very important to understand the philosophy of uh, uh, the on-track and off-track uh, lesion. As you know, literature, recent and not so recent literature, show that uh, uh, the prevalence of uh, uh, glenoid bone loss is, is pretty high, uh, regardless of the size, but almost all the cases with uh, history of shoulder stability as a, a uh, mild to severe glenoid bone loss. And even if the MRI is a good tool to assess the presence and the size of uh, this glenoid bone defect, uh, the CT scan, and uh, specifically the three, these, um, the volume rendering technique uh, uh, for a CT scan, still remains the, the standard for the assessment of the size, the type, and the presence of a glenoid bone defect. And the critical size has been um, uh, assessed uh, according to different uh, clinical and biomechanical studies, and the six millimeters, which corresponds to 25% of the glenoid width, which correspond to 20% of the inferior part of the glenoid, uh, is considered a critical size because it increased dramatically the instability and, uh, and uh, implies a higher risk of recurrence after uh, surgical repair. But recent studies show that there is a subcritical size and it's uh, almost 35% of the uh, inferior glenoid. Uh, and this because uh, clinical reports showed a lower uh, functional scores in patients with the uh, uh, glenoid defect exceeding these sides and an increased risk of failure after bank repair uh, when uh, the glenoid defect is uh, more than 30 percent. Regarding the humeral defect, the humeral head defect, you know that uh, the prevalence uh, is not so um, high as high as uh, for glenoid side, but it's pretty high as well. You see these studies show the uh, 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 prevalence ranging between 47 to 80 percent of the cases. But what is important is that there uh, some others documented a higher risk of recurrence after um, repair in presence of a large uh, humerus, um, um, humeral head defects. But what is large humeral head defect? Burkhardt and the Beer first uh, uh, described this mechanism of engaging of the hill sucks lesion, and they showed that the, the hill sucks has a different behavior according to the size, and, but basically according to the orientation of the uh, gleno or the defect on the posterior superior pole of the humeral head. And when uh, there is an engagement of this lesion and on the anterior rim of the glenoid, the risk of recurrence increases even after an arthroscopic soft tissue repair. But again, what is critical size for this kind of injury? Um, different reports show the critical size ranging between 20% to 40%, but 20 to 40% of what? So uh, some biomechanical studies show that 25% of the radius or 38% or 5 8 it of the radius could be considered a critical size. But there is no universally accepted method to quantify a heel sucks lesion. And uh, regarding the sides and the relationship between the sides of the heel sucks defect and the risk of failure, you see that there is some correlation between the glenoid bone loss and the humeral head bone loss, but this is not linear correlation. What we can say, is that there is a higher risk of a large, so-called large hill sucks defect when the history is of recurrent instability and in case of a higher number of the events of dislocation and in uh, cases of collision or contact sports. Some biomechanical studies suppose that uh, uh, the combination of these two lesions is uh, relevant 
to the outcome of our surgical treatment. So a combination of a small uh, defect on the glenoid sides and the medium health sucks, or a large glenoid defect and a small health sucks, or a medium on both sides, uh, could be uh, a good indication for a bone loss procedure, a bone uh, reconstruction procedure. So in these uh, scenarios, uh, arthroscopic stabilization, soft tissue repair is not enough. And uh, when you have a large defect on both sides, so more than 20% on the glenoid and more than 30% on the humeral head, probably also lateral jet procedure is not enough. So you see that there is an evolution of the concept of bone loss according to the uh, observation of the combination of the two lesions. And uh, Yamamoto, Ito, basically um, uh, described first the concept of the glenoid track. What is the glenoid track? When you have an arm uh, in a rise position and the, you have a contact between the glenoid and the humeral head and the glenoid contact area shifts from the inferomedial to the superior lateral portal, a, a portion of the, of the humeral head when you have the arm in a 90 degrees um, of abduction. And uh, when you have an intact glenoid tract, you don't have, uh, without significant bone loss on both sides, uh, you have a good bone stability. So a soft tissue procedure can guarantee a, a successful uh, outcome. How we can measure this glenoid track? This is another study, more recent study, that showed that the distance between the medial margin of the contact area and the medial margin of the rotator cuff footprint should be 83% of the width of the glenoid. And this is the, uh, the method to quantify the glenoid track. So you can measure uh, this distance between the medial side of the footprint and the medial side of the contact area. And uh, when you uh, me measure your glenoid and you uh, compare these two measures, you can understand if there is a mismatch between these two distances. And D. Giacomo, Itoi, and Burkert showed the, and evolved this concept of the glenoid track and uh, described the so-called on-track or off-track. So what is on track or off track uh, hill sucks defect? These are the two distances. 83% of the glenoid applied over the humeral head, which corresponds to the glenoid track. And this is the hill sucks lesion, the red line. So if the medial margin of the hill sucks is within the glenoid track, there is a bone support uh, adjacent to the hill sucks lesion, and the hill sucks is on track. So bone stability is, is guaranteed. But when the medial margin of the hill sucks, the red line, exceeds, is more medial than the glenoid track, there is no bone support and there is a higher risk of failure after soft tissue repair. But what is uh, uh, rather unpredictable is that bone loss on the glenoid sides is variable so the 83% that we calculate should not be considered on the healthy glenoid because the glenoid is not healthy in the, mo in the majority of the cases. So when we consider this glenoid track on the humeral head, we should measure the 83%, 83% of the glenoid width minus the glenoid loss on the anterior side, which can be measured according to the glenoid width or according to the um, circle method. But what is important is this distance should be reduced and should be reported over the humeral head to assess exactly the, hum the glenoid track in this particular case. And in this particular case, we can consider this lesion as a off track or on track, depending on the size of the glenoid lesion. Uh, what is, uh, uh, which is the best method to assess the on-track or off-track condition. The 3D CT scan for sure is probably the most accurate and um, MRI also been used because, uh, and has been suggested because there is a higher, <coughs> higher evidence, evidence of the footprint of the um, rotator cuff. But 
What is uh, sure is that the accuracy and the positive predictive value and negative predictive value, so the diagnostic accuracy of these tools is uh, still questionable. So this recent study showed that uh, uh, there is a high risk of uh, uh, bipolar lesion, an off-track lesion, uh, in uh, specific conditions. Adolescents have a higher risk, and the history of multiple dis dislocation implies a higher risk of uh, off-track lesion. But what is important is that uh, when you have a, an on-track lesion, the risk of recurrence after surgery is a 5%, according to this study, versus 33% when you have an off-track lesion. So this is very important to um, plan your surgery when you have these patients. This is a recent study published in 2016 and showed that the on-track or off-track measurements should be considered also after surgery because, as I said before, when you have a large defect on both sides, probably the standard latter is not enough to neutralize this mechanism. And if you measure uh, the on-track uh, after Latage procedure, you see that cases that had still an off track condition postoperatively had a four times, fourfold higher risk of recurrence after Latage. So, probably in these cases, a bone graft on the humeral side plus Latage should be considered. But uh, what is really concerning uh, is that, as you can see here, the reliability of assessment of the on-track, off-track condition is pretty low. It's uh, an intra-rate reliability as a coefficient of 0 0.687, but the inter-rate reliability is very, very low. It's unacceptable. And this is another study that confirmed that the measurement of the glenoid ball loss is pretty reliable, and but uh, the measurement of the on-track or off-track condition, so the size of the um, humor head effect is still uh, uh, less reproducible. So the importance of the bipolar defects has been probably understood, but uh, the humor head defect measurement is still under debate, and the on-track off-track concept has not been standardized. This is our contribute uh, to the measurement of the uh, humor head effect. And we, we are collecting data, we are trying to understand also the role of the volume of the humor head effect. This is an image processing software which can uh, uh, superimpose the two, the two um, humor heads uh, by subtraction of the healthy part uh, from the uh, affected uh, humor head. We can measure exactly the size, the shape, and the volume of the humor head. The method is really reliable, so we start. We, we are trying to understand uh, the correlation with the clinical findings. So, in conclusion, there is a high prevalence of bone defects in the shoulder instability, and the failed repairs and bipolar defects are key factors in the treatment strategies. But the on-track, off-track showed only moderate reliability. Thank you.